Thank you, Harvey, for always offering us beautiful and wonderful music. Whew, it's been a day. <laughs> but these are moments and opportunities where God helps us understand that flexibility and discomfort can be and should be something for us as people of faith not to be shunned, but to be moved into with grace and poise. For in our weakness, God is made strong. I'm saying that for me more so than I'm saying that for you this morning, Fritz. <laughs> Fritz, today we finish our two-part series entitled CTL, CTL, Callous Tongue License. And as we move forward this first Sunday in the season of Advent, continuing with this series, we are indeed hearkened to remind ourselves to be mindful of what we speak. For scripture does remind us to be quick to listen, and slow to speak. Friends, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we move forward in this time of worship, recognizing your presence with us this day, feeling your embrace and your encouragement as we move forward in this time of worship. We open ourselves to you fully, mind, heart, body, and soul, that you might impart to us, equip in us, and instruct us to be the best ambassadors of your grace and love we can be. Hear now our holy prayers as we lift ourselves before you. We now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, will give glory to you. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. Last week, friends, we began our exploration of this third chapter of James, verses 1 through 10, hearing both words of warning and words of instruction and encouragement. Last week, we learned that the book of James challenges Christians to examine how they're living their Christian values, not simply having an opportunity to have a value that they look for Scripture to validate, but rather to look to Scripture to provide them the values by which they live and then to challenge them to put those into practice. Chapter 3 deals with language that Christians use, and we ask ourselves the question, how should a Christian, a follower of Christ, speak to others, both believer and unbeliever? Chapter 3, verse 1 through 2, warned us that when we make ourselves teachers or those who offer godly wisdom and advice as spiritual advisors, we are judged more sternly, held to a higher account for miseducation is as dangerous as ignorance. Lastly, we discover that spiritual mature and maturing followers of Christ allow the Holy Spirit to filter their thoughts before they become words. Asking themselves two important questions, does what I'm going to say need to be said? Does what I'm going to say need to be said? And two, if Christ were here, would I say what I'm about to say? If Christ was here, would I say what I'm about to say? Today, we pick up where we left off in verses 9 and 10 as we seek to answer the question, how can we tame the tongue? How can we tame the tongue? How can we tame our tongues? The author of James paints a bleak picture in verses 5 through 8, verse 8 particularly, where the author writes, But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. What a wonderful image we have. The news does not get any better as we look throughout the rest of the text. Verses 9 and 10 offer us this. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and curse, my brothers and sisters, this ought not be. You may have experienced this yourself, friends. The same tongue that sang praises in the sanctuary quickly became the tongue that ridiculed another person for having a tattoo or having a different shade of hair color. The same tongue that was about to give God blessing became the same tongue that gossiped about a co-worker. The same tongue that said, baby, I love you, became the same tongue that said, you ain't, you fill in the blank. 
So how can we tame the tongue? How can we tame this restless evil? I'm glad you asked that question. You always ask very good questions. The answer for that question is simple but difficult in its implementation. For indeed, friends, we cannot tame the tongue. Only God can. And God, in partnership with us, offers us the opportunity to be reminded to tame our thoughts, to tame our words and language before they come out of our mouth and we cannot take them back. The CPL instructor I consulted in researching this sermon series said that the biggest mistake that people who decide to get a CPL license make is that they neglect to train. They take the eight-hour class, sit in a classroom for six hours, go out on the range and practice. Then after that, they stop, this instructor said. They don't go on to master the disciplines of that particular firearm that they have. They don't avail themselves of more advanced classes in order to master the complex motor skills of drawing a concealed firearm under pressure. Likewise, my brothers and sisters, Many of us neglect training our spirits. We don't set aside time to nourish our spirits. We don't avail ourselves of Bible study classes to deepen our understanding of the word of God and how to apply it to our lives, which brings us to point number one, friends. In order to tame our tongues, we need to commit to spiritual disciplines of prayer, study of scripture, and silence. We need to commit ourselves to the spiritual disciplines of prayer, the study of God's word, and silence. So that the wisdom of God will inhabit our minds and our mouths. For indeed, great grandma's wisdom and word to us was still and is still very valid. If you don't have anything good to say, We find that to be one of the more difficult conditions of what grandma offered us in wisdom that that indeed, if we don't have something good to say, some of us had a difficult time containing that, keeping our mouth closed. It all of a sudden spills out before we have a chance to capture it and capture the thought before that thought becomes word. But grandma was right. It's not simply studying scripture. It's not taking time to pray and to have communion and conversation with God. Sometimes you got to be quiet long enough to allow God to speak. And in most instances, be quiet long enough for you to get past what you thought you was going to say that needed to be said to the person who needed to be said it to before they walked away from your presence. Amen. We are reminded of that adage that says silence is golden and oftentimes we misuse that and misinterpret it and we use that when we're referring to children that I ought to be silent in certain places I am thankful for a loud noisy baby in a church for indeed I believe that babies have a connection to the Holy Spirit that we don't have. And so when they're talking throughout a message and they're moving throughout a service, they're having communion with the Holy Spirit that we who have outgrown that sense of naivete no longer have a sense of touching the divine in ways that is precious and joy filled. And sometimes infants and children remind us you're taking too long. It don't really take all that. (laughs) And so we are reminded that indeed, in order to tame the tongue, we must commit to the process of spiritual disciplines of prayer, the study of scripture and of silence so that the wisdom of God will inhabit our minds and our mouths. That's why we study. That's why we pray so that the word of God can start influencing the way that we think and the way that we think begins to influence the way that we speak and the way that we speak influences the way that we act. And so friends, in order to tame the tongue, we must commit to those spiritual disciplines. Indeed, For those of you who are worshiping with us virtually, I want to offer you a a refrain that you can take with us. You can type that in the comment section. Uh, You have to train to tame. You have to train to tame. We cannot expect that our language is going to change if we are not infusing ourselves with something to change our language. I remember that uh, when I was in seminary and uh, yeah, uh, I was in seminary and I still had a cursing problem. I know it's shocking. I understand. 
But the pastor at the time said, it's not enough to stop cursing. You have to start saying something different so that you train your mind to replace what you should not say with something that is more beneficial. So every time you want to say something uh, that is not going to bring glory to God, say something like, God bless you. Or, may the peace of God be with you. Or, the more difficult and challenging phrase, whatever hurt you're having that's causing you to act this way, I pray God heals. And so I began the practice of replacing what I should not say with what I wanted to say, what needed to be said, so much so that it became second nature and the thoughts became captured and the words became flesh and what came out of my mouth was what I wanted to have come out of my mouth. And over the course of time, not only did it change how I spoke to people, but it changed what I was thinking myself. Proverbs 5, 1 or 15 verses 1 through 2 says that, The difference between those who are willing to be godly trained versus those who continue on their own way is this. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise dispenses knowledge, but the mouth of fools pour out folly. Indeed, we've heard the adage said before, you can be a fool and no one will know it until you open your mouth. Indeed, we've all been foolish and have had those moments where we've opened our mouths and said something, even uh, in jest, where we were around certain people who will always remember. You remember when you said and you slipped, and, and they have that as a running joke. Those are jesting, those, those times that we can laugh at, but there are also moments where someone reminds us, yeah, you, you said something so unkind to me that I can't get past it. And while the rest of our relationship has continued to flourish, there's still that part of me that remembers that you took something that I told you in confidence, weaponized it in order to make me feel bad. C-T-L. Consistently exercising spiritual disciplines is essential for taming our tongues because they help us identify our strengths and our weaknesses, which brings us to point number two, friends. To tame the tongue, God will show us our limitations, the situations, the activities, and the people that constantly and consistently challenge our control of our tongues. There are certain situations, certain activities, and certain people that challenge our ability to control our tongue. And what God helps us understand is that we're not strong enough to resist those temptations yet. That's why every person that's in a 12-step program has step number one is to admit that you have a problem. And part of those 12 steps is to recognize there's certain places you can't be anymore, certain situations you can't be in anymore, certain people you can't be around anymore because they hinder your sobriety and you're not strong enough to overcome it. Now, to admit our weaknesses does not make us weak. It actually makes us stronger. For the foolish person is the one that says, I'm strong enough to resist this when they know in their hearts they are not. It is foolish to believe as an alcoholic that you can walk into a bar and not be tempted. It's foolish to believe as someone who used to curse that you can hang around folks who curse all the time and not be affected. It's foolish to believe that we're strong enough, even with the help of the Holy Spirit. And that's the great gift of the Holy Spirit, friends. The Holy Spirit reminds us you're not strong enough to be in this situation, to indulge in this activity, to be around this people. And so the wisest thing for you to do is not to be there. When Jesus was tempted, Satan took him to the highest mountain and says, you can throw yourself down from this peak because the word says that God will send angels concerning you. And his response is the response of someone who understands weakness. He says, do not put the Lord God to the test. Now, this is Jesus. The very son of God, the savior, all all human and all divine who recognizes that I cannot put myself in danger in order for God to rescue me. Many of us have heard the story before. There was somebody who was in the midst of a flood. And as the water started to rise over this house and he finds himself on the roof of this house, he says, Lord, save me and protect me. And what happens next? The boat comes by and he says, no, I'm not going to get into the boat. I'm waiting for God to save me. And after that comes a raft. He says, I'm not getting on the raft. I'm waiting for God to save me. And after that comes a helicopter. And he says, I'm not getting to the helicopter. I'm waiting for God to save me. And obviously we remember the end of the story. The flood riders rise. He drowns. And when he gets to heaven, 
He says, Lord, why didn't you save me? And he says, I sent you a boat. I sent you a raft. I sent you a helicopter. What more were you expecting me to do? I was expecting you, Lord, to stretch out your hand from heaven to pick me up and put me on dry ground. I was testing to see what you would do to actively be in participation as opposed to partner with others to be a blessing to me. Oh, that's good, Holy Spirit. That filled my soul. God helps us to be in partnership to be a blessing to others. That's why we end each and every service with you are a blessing from God now. God partners with us to be a blessing to others, to help others out in situations. And God partners with us to help us understand there's certain things you just can't do anymore because you're not strong enough to withstand it. Scripture reminds us of this troubling adage. It says that the wicked will always corrupt the righteous. I said, Lord, that that seems to be a little problematic for me because why shouldn't the righteous always influence the wicked? And as I began to think and ponder about that, it's because the wicked have no boundary. The wicked don't have any restraint. And so, yes, I recognize you're starting to, you, you, you want to stop cussing. I, I, I appreciate that, but I, I haven't made that commitment. I realize that, that you're trying to live a sober life, but I haven't made that commitment. And I'm more indulgent of myself than I am respecter of your desire. And so, friends, some things you just can't do anymore, and it makes you stronger. In the eight-hour class that those persons who have for their CPL license, they are learning the importance of certain places and things they can no longer do. They cannot consume alcohol while caring. They cannot carry in hospitals, schools, daycare facilities, entertainment facilities of a capacity of 2,500 or more. I learned all of this. This was a great conversation. Sports arenas, college dormitories, classrooms, casinos, federal buildings, and churches. Likewise, as a CTO holder friends, God reveals to us the situations, activities, and people that we must limit our presence in and interaction with in order to continue to have control over our tongues. We need to know what situations cause us to lose control of our tongues. For some, it may be watching the Lions on Thanksgiving Day. (laughs) For others, it may be that third and fourth glass or bottle of whatever. Still others, it may be that cousin or coworker that always seems to take you down the wrong pathway. Friends, God will grant us discernment for the situations, activities, and people that we need to limit our interaction with in order to maintain control of these tongues and the things that come out of our mouth. Now, let's be clear, friends. God does not expect us to be perfect and without choice words and to slip into occasions. God does not expect us to be perfect, but point three reminds us that God expects that we will continue to mature spiritually, being more mindful of what comes out of our mouths. God expects that we will continue to mature spiritually, being more mindful of what comes out of our mouths. Can I say that I never curse? No, I can't say that. Every now and again, something does slip out. I try to make sure that it's behind closed doors and it's between me and Lord. (laughs) (sighs) But that doesn't become a habit. It doesn't come out as it used to. It wasn't a part of my regular vocabulary so that I had to hinder myself in speaking. God does not expect us to be perfect. There was only one perfect one. But what God expects us is that we continue to mature spiritually, being more mindful of what comes out of our mouths, asking ourselves those questions that spiritually mature, maturing people ask. Does what I'm about to say need to be said? And would I say the same thing if Jesus was standing here? God expects and intends that we grow into what is described in Proverbs 10, 19 through 20, when words are many, transgression is lacking, but the prudent are restrained in speech. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The mind of the wicked is little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many. Indeed, friends, God intends and hopes and desires for us to get better, to get stronger. But it is a willful, intentional decision to say, I'm going to be mindful of what comes out of my mouth. And if I don't have anything good to say, I'm not saying anything at all. 
Controlling what comes out of our mouths is not easy, especially when we've been ministered and mistreated and ridiculed by those around us. Yet we must remember that what comes out of our mouths is not merely a reflection of who we are, but also a reflection of our relationship with God. Taming the tongue is a challenge that requires consistent practice of those spiritual disciplines and awareness of our limitations and a commitment to continue maturing in our faith. I pray, friends, this last five days of our challenge of not saying anything critical, of not complaining, of not offering a callous word surprised you. How'd you do? Yeah, it was one of those. Especially as we gathered around tables and for those of us who decided to embark upon the penance of actually watching the lions, you, you found yourself in moments where something may have come to mind and trying to figure out not to say it. Or there may have been somebody gathered around the table that offered opinion that, that you said to yourself, mm, I know what Pastor Hood said, but <laughs> that's the challenge. That's the work, friends. And so... For this next seven days until we gather again, I offer you a very simple challenge, but hard to implement as well. I encourage you to ask yourself one question as you have conversations this week. Will what I'm about to say make God smile? C-T-L. This is the word of God for the people of God.